Hello and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, episode 42, for Beltane 2018. We have a really long show for you today, and it's because we included a workshop in the podcast. Normally, I save the workshops for the bonus episodes, but they're starting to build up, and I have a few. And this workshop was so popular that people were just clamoring for me to put it into the podcast so they could hear it again. So what could I do? I had to present it. We're going to start off, though, with Pandy's Pagan Projects, and she's going to continue her series on making your portable altar. We're going to go into making the elements. After that, we will hear from Raina and what to do to honor your beloved dead at Beltane. And then we're going to have a very special workshop, which was put on by Amy Blackthorne called Making Magical Oils. Now, Amy is a well-known and celebrated author, and she does teach and has been teaching for many years, and she does workshops around the country. She was most recently at Equinox in the Oaks in April, and if you missed it, you can hear her workshop here, or you can go to Mystic South, which is where Amy will be in July. And we'll have more information on how you can attend Mystic South later on in the episode. And we'll have some music, not as much as normal, but we will have some maypole dancing music ready for you towards the end of the episode. So stay tuned. Blessed be. Greetings and salutations, podcast listeners. This is Alpandia, and it's time for another one of Pandy's Pagan Projects. We're continuing to work on our travel altars. If you've been following along so far, you should have a pentacle and possibly a wand, as well as some idea of what else you might want to incorporate into your altar setup. Today, we'll be making elemental representations that we use in our travel altar. I do have some craftiness coming, but let's discuss this a little bit first. There are many different ways to represent the elements in our travel altar, and you should use the one that works best for you. One way to do this would be to make stone, clay, or wooden markers that have the element's name and or symbol on them. That's what we'll be doing in this project, but that's not the only way to carry your elements with you. You could find smaller objects or items that represent the elements to you. Finding these items is all sorts of fun and gets you outside and involved in your environment. You might find a lovely rock for earth, a shell for water, a donated bird feather for air, and perhaps a fiery looking bead for fire. Being open to the universe adding items to your altar is a wonderful way to build your go bag. For an impatient witch like me though, I have a plan to make some elemental representations that'll travel with me until the universe brings new ones my way. In my current travel altar, I have a set of small boxes. Each has a different elemental color, and each one has a representation of the element inside it. My earth box has pine needles from my first Yule tree. My air box has a tiny set of incense sticks that I was gifted by a clan elder. My water box has a small white shell that reminds me of the moon, and my fire box is filled with cinnamon sticks. While I do love these, They tend to take up a lot of room, and they don't really work for the altar I currently have in mind. You can decorate your elemental tokens in a variety of ways. Some witches put the elemental symbols on them. You know the ones I'm talking about, those traditional triangle-shaped symbols. Others put the name of the element rather than a symbol. Or both. Or you can decorate it with a representation of the element. A flame for fire, 
waves or raindrops for water, mountains or trees for earth, and clouds or wind for air. You can incorporate the beings who are associated with the elements as well. Fairies, lizards, fish, birds, whatever your tradition and spirit calls. There is no wrong way to decorate these. As long as the decorations make sense to you and allow you to connect with the element, that's all that really matters. We're going to start by breaking out our paints or wood burner and decorating small wooden discs. You can get these discs at your local hobby shop. You can also harvest them from your own tree that you love or perhaps have a limb that's donated by someone you love. Cut the rounds to the size that you want and give them a good sanding. Once they're smooth, you can decorate them with paints, markers, or your wood burners. If you're using paints or markers, I would recommend a layer of glaze or Mod Podge over them to protect your work. If you prefer stones, I suggest finding four stones that are about equal size and shape. It's definitely easier to decorate flat stones and they'll store a little better too. You're probably going to use paint on those unless you are good with etching on stone, which I'm not. You can also craft your elemental tokens out of clay. I know, I know, I hear what you're thinking. Alpandia, everything's made of clay. You must have stock in Fimo. But clay is such a wonderful material. You can work your intentions into it as you're crafting. You can add oils, herbs, and powders into it. Plus, you can get it in any color, so it's perfect for magical crafting. With clay, you can mix colors if you want swirls, press designs into the clay before you cook it, or decorate it once it's hardened. Of course, these aren't the only ways to represent the elements in your travel altar. If you're making an altar cloth, which we'll be doing in a later podcast, you can sew, paint, stain, or burn symbols into it. Or you can sew colored cloths together so that when you lay your altar cloth out, the colors sit in the quarters for the elements. One lovely way I've seen the elements represented is in a long string of beads. I have a friend who determined a good size for her altar space and strung beads in that length. At the quarters were beads that represented each of the elements to her, and the spacer beads between them were pretty white beads, since most of her magic on the go is lunar magic. It was even long enough that she could wear it as a necklace while she was traveling, and it needed a little more oomph in her day-to-day activities when she was away from home. I would love to see how you decide to decorate the elements on your travel altar. Head over to our website, emlc.net, and click on the podcast tab to leave us a picture. Or you can head over to facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon and leave us a comment. This would be... Hello everyone, this is Raina Templeby with the Beloved Dead, and this episode is for Beltane. So, we're coming up on the season of one of the major Sabbaths for which is the 1st of May, or Beltane. This is a polar opposite across the wheel of the year from Samhain, and for again, for many people, it feels very, very far away from where we were at Samhain when the dead were, the Beloved Dead were very close to us. However, Many witches know that Beltane is really the other Samhain. And uh, if you think back, you'll probably um, be able to remember that many witches or other spiritual people have passed around Beltane, that there's a depth um, and spookiness to the energy. There's this, this super strong witchy current at Beltane. And sometimes even amidst all of the emphasis on joyful dancing around a maypole and excellent consensual sex, we realize that there's this, uh, that life is growing, but it will fall, uh, and, and we will pass. So 
Sometimes we call Beltane the other Samhain, and that's what I'm going to try and talk about a little bit here today. So there's no reason not to celebrate the 1st of May in as joyful a manner as possible. If you're doing ancestral work, I still think you need to dance the maypole and have great sex and look at beautiful flowers and enjoy the weather as it changes towards warmth in summertime. Simultaneously, your ancestors need tending in a particular set of ways. I'm going to suggest some new altar work at the end of the podcast, but I want to spend a moment or two talking about a couple of things that are relevant for this time of the year. First of all, a very big and important topic is ancestors and conception. So um, it is a well-known fact for those people who have done ancestral work in many different cultures, not just neo-paganism, that ancestors love a welcoming vessel and um, will often be looking for a way to reincarnate on this plane. We spent a little time in the last podcast talking about exactly how that works, and um, I urge you to go back and listen to that if you're not sure, but basically when a Uh, an individual passes over into the other realm, they rest, they're rejuvenated, and when they are ready, they leave the broader soul stream that they're a member of and incarnate as a new personality for a new set of experiences. They retain some memory of previous lifetimes, but most of that is wiped clean so that they can maximize what they learned in the school of hard knocks here on earth. So getting back to the point about conception, Somebody's going to say, what she, what does she mean by that? So what I mean is that when you start working with ancestors, when you start listening to them, when you start honoring them, when you attune to their energy, they will often say, oh, hey, this is a really cool person. Um, I think that this person might make a great vessel for me to come back through to on earth. Um, and so if you're the kind of person who could get pregnant, you need to actually be quite conscious about this. And, um, if you are, the kind of person who doesn't want to be pregnant, then you need to be, you need to incorporate into your ancestral work a very clear message that you are not the kind of person who wants to be pregnant or not the right vessel for them. And you, if you feel a persistent nudge on this, you can even tell that ancestor, I will work to help find you the correct vessel. I am not the correct vessel. Do not be vague on this. If you are clear that you are not the correct vessel because any little, just like with all magic, any little wiggle room um, provides a doorway. And many people have gotten pregnant by surprise when they're doing ancestral work. Now, if on the other hand, you are the kind of person who would like to get pregnant, you should definitely be working with your ancestors and you should definitely make it clear to them that you are interested in having a spirit, helping a spirit come back to earth. A basic principle of witchcraft is that spirits reincarnate within their families, uh, within people that they have known and loved in the past. And so conscious conception, which is a whole thing you can look, you can Google and look for, is essentially the process of being um, a vessel who's clear with about what kind of child they would like to have, um, when they would like to have the child, and then doing what they can to attune to that kind of spirit. And it's very beautiful when it works. Um, and, uh, of course, having a child is very beautiful even when it doesn't. It hasn't happened consciously in advance because we all do things um, sometimes by surprise. However, this is primarily a cautionary note for those who are not seeking to get pregnant that um, they should really be clear with the ancestors that they are not a vessel. And you can even create, I had a teacher teach me how to create a ribbon belt um, that was dedicated to precisely this. So I, when I was younger, was extremely fertile and I, I worked with the ancestors a lot and I got pregnant by surprise a couple of times. And so one of my teachers had me create a, a belt made of ribbons woven together with the intention of not being a vessel for the ancestors and serving them in other ways, right? That was the key part of the piece of magic. I will serve you in other ways. I can't offer you my body at this point in time, right? So, however, if you are interested in uh, conception, then please make that really clear. Be specific about the kind of child you want. Um, do you want a child who's pagan? 
Do you want a child who's very, very healthy? Do you want a child who's open-minded, um, who's lucky, who's of a happy spirit, who's very, very intelligent? You, you, the more specific you can be, the more you will help this right spirit be attracted to you. And then you need to talk to all your mothers who were pregnant before you, your mother, your grandmothers, their mothers, as many of those spirits as you can, and tell them, make sure they know that you're ready and that, that you're a loving vessel for a new incarnation from the family soul stream. Okay, so um, another thing I wanted to talk about just a little bit, uh, Beltane, is the various kinds of ancestry testing that are available. A lot of people who are doing ancestral work, even people who are not witches and, and pagans, but who are interested in genealogy, will seek out uh, genetic testing. It's a new thing. Everybody's doing it. It's not that expensive anymore. And it's a wonderful way to augment your ancestral work. So I just wanted to take a moment to explain the three main different types of genetic testing that you can do. Um, and it's important to know which type you want because they have different sorts of results. Okay, so mitochondrial DNA testing is the first kind that was developed maybe about 20 years ago. And it basically only tells you your maternal lines haplogroup, which means the original family or maternal line that you seem to come through. And so your maternal DNA is passed on for very, very consistently over very long periods of time. And there are only so many of these groups um, that we believe existed in the past. So if you do uh, mitochondrial DNA testing, you will find out um, which of these, I think there are about 20 right now, um, maternal lines you originated in. And we're talking originated, like we're talking 20,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago. So very, very deep time. I was super interested in that kind of information because I wanted that deep time ancestral connection. And um, so I got that kind of testing done. Um, if you've read The Seven Daughters of Eve, that's a wonderful book that explains this whole kind of testing better. All right. Another type of testing, a separate test, is a Y DNA, which is the Y chromosome, which is only carried by men. So the Y chromosome does not preserve for as great a length of time as mitochondrial DNA. So this is something that men can do to find out also fairly deep time ancestry, maybe not 40,000 years ago, but maybe 10 to 12,000 years ago. And it's inherited father to son. So, of course, if you are a woman and you're interested in this kind of information, you would want to have a biological male relative do this test. So, for example, I had my um, paternal uncle do this since my father had passed. And that is just going to give you another whole strain of information. Now, the third kind is called autosomal testing. And that's the part that's, that's the kind that's become the most popular right now. So that's what Not Geo does, what Ancestry.com does, what 23andMe does. This is looking at, um, particular kind of chromosomes that are inherited from both of your parents and your very recent ancestors. So really it only goes back, um, a, maybe a few hundred years in time, depending on how long everybody's living. It's great for matching you to people who are alive today and other people who have had this testing done. So it's the kind of test when you get your results, you're going to, you're going to, they're going to give you a statistical match to a whole bunch of other people who are in the database. Um, and the more people who do this kind of testing and the more people who are in the database, the, the more powerful this becomes. So this is what most uh, genealogists choose as a form of genetic testing because it helps them find missing relatives, maybe people who are adopted or people who just, um, they haven't been able to, you know, everybody has the same name, everybody's John Owens, and they want to find the exact right person who's a second cousin or a third cousin or something like that. So I urge you to think about one of those three different kinds of testing. They result in different kinds of ancestral information, and that's all interesting. If you can do all of the testing, that's great too. There'll probably be more of these tests available as time goes on. All right. Now, in terms of um, altar work for this time of the year, for Beltane, Beltane is a very big uh, Sabbath for witches and pagans, and it's a busy time of the year also, so I didn't want to give you too much homework. But what I'd like you to consider is that echoing Samhain and the work that we did at Samhain 
a wonderful thing to do at Beltane is to make a food offering to your ancestors. We haven't really done this since last, uh, since last Samhain. Um, so it's, you know, halfway around the wheel. It's very appropriate to do another food offering that will balance what you did at Samhain. Um, this time I'd like you to consider rather than making uh, a recipe that you know one of your relatives loved, like your Aunt Jane's favorite cake, I'd like you to think about doing a recipe that's new to you, but is from a culture that is part of your ancestry. So again, we're kind of expanding out our concept of ancestors over the last couple of turns of the wheel to think broadly about our, our human family. So if um, through genealogical research or stories in your family, um, or even through maybe genetic testing, you found out that you have German ancestry, maybe you want to try just looking through some recipes um, for German foods and try making something new. And then again, you're going to put that on your, on your altar for them. You're going to leave that um, for three days or less if it's not feasible to leave it for that long. And then you're going to offer it to the earth afterwards, right? So it's not for you to eat. Uh, it's for them. You can, you're free to make an additional dish of it, like a separate dish, maybe split the recipe in half and have that part for yourself so you can learn about what this new dish was like and see if you like it. Um, the reason I'm asking you to do something you haven't done before in terms of a recipe is, again, a way to attune to the vibration of your ancestry. So if you have a bunch of German ancestors and you don't really know that much about German culture or speak the language or have much of a memory of the German foods or cult customs that your family had, this brings you into a vibrational connection again. It brings you closer to those ancestors, to things that they may have eaten, to ingredients that they may have grown in their gardens or known about, and again, then brings you into contact. So that strengthens your connection to those ancestors and strengthens your ability to tap into them when you need it. All right. Happy Beltane, everyone, and I'll see you again next time. Those who have died have never, never died, but they have a pact with the living. Is the ancestor's word in the voice of the water? Hello, EMLC podcast listeners. I'm Marla Robertson, a member of EMLC and the workshop coordinator from Mystic South. Our conference highlights the southern flair and mystic spirit of our own part of the country, be it witch, pagan, heathen, or hoodoo, and the various flavors that exist in between and beyond all those. Please join us in Atlanta, July 13th through 15th. You can find out information on our headliners, workshops, and our academic track at our website at mysticsouth.com. That's M-Y-S-T-I-C hyphen S-O-U-T-H dot com. You have not met me yet. My name is Amy Blackburn. I have been teaching since 1999 and I am absolutely thrilled to be here. I have had theater training so I'm happily I can talk over the thunder that is joining us for the, the this part of the program. Um, I am the uh, owner and designer of uh, Blackthorn Hoodoo Blends at blackthornhoodooblends.com. So I'm also the author of Blackthorn's Botanical Magic, which will be out September 1st from Wiser Books. Thank you so much, Wiser, because they're amazing. They've, they've treated me very, very well. Redwheelwiser.com. Um, you can order it. I know it's on Amazon. It's on, it's on barnesandnoble.com. It's also on bookdepository.com if you're outside the United States. Those of you listening on the EMLC podcast, order, yes, pre-order now. Um, and especially those of you on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com, if they lower the price at any point, you'll get the lowest price for their um, low price guarantee. Thank you so much. I am a, uh, I'm definitely an interactive teacher. I, I enjoy doing this. I teach because I, I love the light bulb moments that happen during class. So if you have questions, please feel free to engage. I want us to engage as, as a group. Um, I, I started in teaching uh, magical gardening and, and working with plant magic, and I have, I've been teaching every other week for probably since 2007. I'm very engaged in my teaching. 
So the goal of this class uh, largely is not just to engage with the oils that we have here and have a make and take at the end of the class, um, but to talk about largely how the magical oils that we're creating can act as magic itself. Okay, so we're taking a journey not just with the oils themselves as singular entities like uh, we can with the book. So the book will answer questions, how can, the, how can we take um, a single bottle of essential oil and how can we take um, a singular ingredient and cast a wide variety of magical styles with a single ingredient? And we're going to talk about the different ways that our single ingredient can be changed by the carriers and the carrier oils that we use in our magical oils that we create, okay? Um, our carrier oils are really, really important. In talking about magical aromatherapy, uh, a lot of emphasis gets put on essential oils because they, they're the, the magical fuel in which we, we drive our car because there's a lot of flavor that goes with that, so to speak. We're not, obviously we're not, we're not ingesting these, but the, the idea of flavor powers that magic. But the carrier that we choose to uh, base our oils with can add its own magical flavor as well, okay? Now, so the goal of this class is to discuss the flavor in which we, we choose to power our magic and what those carriers can add to our, our magical workings. Just by changing the carrier, we can completely change the flavor of our magic. Even if we use the same oils, we can completely change the magic that we're doing by changing the carriers. Okay? Now, there are lots of different types of oils, and we'll, we'll sort of touch on those very briefly. These, these very handy little bottles that I have in front of me are something called essential oils. Is there anyone um, sitting in on the class that does not know what an essential oil is? No shame. That's why we're all here. Okay. So we have the vital and the volatile oils that are produced by plant materials, right? Most of the time they're steam distilled. It's the quickest and easiest way of producing the oils that is the, the volatile or the part that you can smell. Uh, we say volatile because it evaporates very quickly. The volatile plant materials that you smell and you concentrate that very, very beautiful smell into a very, very small material, very small components called those, their oil parts. Okay. So we have in front of us in the oil that we're going to make and so you can take it home with you. Uh, so in front of us, I have lavender, patchouli, and clary sage. And we're going to use these in a little bit. Anyone who was here yesterday, I used lavender as my example a lot because it's one of the most popular oils ever. You know, it gets used frequently because it's one, it's easy to produce. Most people know what it is. One of the very neat parts about lavender is so many people know what it is. They've heard of it. They've worked with it. Lavender is one of the few essential oils that has something called a chemotype. Okay. We've, we've heard of essential oils. Everyone, no one raised their hand. They knew what essential oils were. Does anyone know what a chemotype is? No. No. Is that because when I was trying to buy that, there was like French lavender. There was like another country's lavender. Does that have anything to do with it? It does. See? Yeah, I learned something today. <laughs> she learned You're something. So yes. smart. No, I can just read. No, you know <laughs> Okay. Chemotypes are a very specific kind of um, essential oil. So there are a couple different plant types. So lavender is one of them. Thyme is one of them. Uh, rosemary is one of them. So you'll see different types of these oils. And they'll have a little designation in lowercase letters where it'll say CT with a period. It's a very specific designation in there in the essential oil. And it'll say CT and it'll have a chemical name after it. So thyme CT linalool. Okay. These chemotypes are a very special kind of essential oil. What it means is instead of the more common essential oil that you find on the shelf at Whole Foods or your, your local New Age or local witchy store, these very, usually a small batch essential oils are grown in a particular area, we'll say in the hills of France, <laughs> okay? And because of their distinct elevation, their soil type, the way they were grown and they were treated and someone talked nice to them and the soil was very special, okay? 
because they were treated and they were grown very specially, the chemical components of this essential oil were very special. They had a completely different chemical makeup of all the other lavenders that are grown normally, which is why they get a chemotype, okay? Which means it could do something completely different. Chemotypes are, are similar. They're the same essential oil. They just uh, have different chemical uh, concentrations. So does that mean they might smell a little different? They will smell slightly different. The, the chemical concentrations will act for different things. So depending on, for example, like uh, the chemotype linalool time may be used for different, have uh, asthmatic conditions. Magically, they're all used the same, but aromatically, you know, for aromatherapy, they may, they'll have different uses okay. and needs. Is one considered more like desirable than another because of where it's grown or for different reasons? Um, for, work? for aromatherapy, yes. For magic, no. When you're talking about essential oils for magic, it's really important to know what is important for your ethics as far as where you're sourcing them. Okay. For your household and your purse needs, it may be important to get the most effective for your purse. Okay. Your, your wallet may be the most important designation. Okay. It may be more morally sound to make sure you have an ethical company. Okay. These things are really important for you to understand before you go shopping because the cost of your materials is going to come into play very quickly. Okay. Rose absolute, you know, that's 10% in jojoba is still going to cost in, in the upwards of fifties for a two milliliter bottle, which is about this big, tiny, tiny bottle. Okay. Whereas a small batch of wild crafted eucalyptus, you know, keep in mind, understanding the ethics of what you need and where you need it and how you want to source it is going, if you decide it before you go out, it'll be easy for you to understand where you're going to draw the lines before you get out there and look at prices. Okay. Um, this comes into play very, um, it's going to be more important when you look at things like sandalwood, a bottle of sandalwood, we'll say 10 milliliter bottle of sandalwood. You're looking at about 60 bucks from a from a budget company. Okay. Knowing the price going in is going to be important because a company that's going to be cheaper is more than likely poaching that sandalwood. Okay. Sandalwood is a beautiful oil, but they have to harvest the entire tree to get that oil. Okay know your ethics before you go shopping for your materials. If you're getting Australian sandalwood, which is a beautiful and gorgeous oil and it is, it is ethically harvested, it is ethically sourced, and the largest farm where Australian sandalwood is grown, the largest farm in Australia is larger than the entire country of France. For every one tree that they harvest to source for their um, sandalwood, it, they have to plant four trees. Okay. They're doing it the right way. They're ethically sourcing their materials. They treat the earth with respect. Like, you know, your materials, you know, where it's coming from. They know how it's being treated. Doing five minutes of research can help you not only sleep a little bit better at night, but know that you're paying for the materials that you know you want and you need. So what's the difference? It's not just the prices that you're paying. A lot of people that are looking at their, their materials, whether it's a handwritten book of shadows from your high priestess's high priest, or it's a, uh, a book that you found in Barnes and Noble, the recipes that you're going to find can be written in parts. They can be written in drops for the sizes of the, the materials that you're buying and the amounts that you're going to be making. It's going to make a difference. Okay. The recipes that we're going to look at, you can be making a bottle this big, you can be making a bottle this big, but our budgets and our resources are very precious to us. We do not want to waste these very precious materials. Okay. For example, our very helpful coordinator went out and got us jojoba oil, which, uh, as you know, we'll find out has a shelf life at the very minimum. If this is, is if this oil is treated with respect of at the very least about two years. Okay. So we got something, uh, like a hoba instead of, uh, something that has a shelf life of three or four months. So if you go, if this finds its way to the bottom of your camping bag and you forget about it until next year, it's probably still going to be good. 
Whereas if you had if we had used a cheaper oil and you found it at the bottom of your bag next year when you unpacked and you had a rancid bottle of grossness. Okay? <laughs> because our resources are, are very precious to us, you know. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk about blending essential oils. When we are blending, when we have our materials, when we have our, our recipes in front of us. When we have a material like this, we're going to do this a little bit differently today because uh, for ease of uh, the number of people in here, we're going to have to add our oil first and add our drops in. So do as we say and that as I do. When you're at home, you're going to blend your uh, essential oils into a glass container, swirl them around to sort of mix them together, and then add your carrier in on top of that. You know, try and get them together. If you're doing a larger volume, you can start with half drops and then another half and sort of blend them together. But with a group this size, we're going to need to make sure we have enough oil for everybody. The carrier oils that we're going to talk about are going to be the really important part. Every carrier oil that we have that we talk about deserves the respect of the ingredient. The essential oils may be the star of a lot of people's different shows, but the carrier oils that we talk about are <laughs> not the the guest star. Okay, they deserve the material, the respect, the same materials deserve okay base oils affect the way that our magic is created and displayed just the same way our essential oils do the life of the plant is stored and created just the way our essential oils do what is a seed anybody potential yes okay an acorn is what a potential tree okay an acorn is not an oak tree an acorn is the potential of a tree Okay, if an acorn is gobbled up by a squirrel, it's now squirrel food. Okay, but an acorn is not a tree; is the potential to be a tree. An, a an oak tree is a tree, but that o acorn is just the potential for a tree. So when you're using something like sunflower seed oil, okay, or any of the nut seed oils, your magic is the magic for potential. So if you're choosing to use any of those nut-based oils, your magic is now the magic for potential. Okay? So changing how the way you look at the carrier oils that you're using changes how the way the, the way that you're looking at your magic itself. When we talk about the morphology of the plants that we're using, um, not just the essential oils or the base oils themselves, but all of the pieces that go into our magic, okay, it's really important to understand all of the pieces come together as the spell itself, okay? Once it goes into here, you know, okay, it is now all the pieces and parts of a spell. So the morphology or the, the parts of a plant that go into these oils affect how it works. So we have the flowers, okay? What are, what are flowers again? What part of a plant? Sex organs, yes, okay? It's okay, you can say it, we're all, we're all grown-ups here. Okay, so if flowers are the sex organs of a plant, what can uh, flower-based essential oils do? Get you lucky. Get you lucky, absolutely, yes. This is audience participation, it's okay. No, seriously. And I'm just Creativity, yes. Okay, anybody else? Manifest. Manifest, yes, absolutely. Any other ideas? Maybe like a, a glamour, like a... Yes. So if you are going on a blind date and you want to glamour yourself into feeling a little bit more confident and sexy, okay. I might make up an oil with a seed carrier so you can see the blossoming of a new relationship. Absolutely. Okay. So the parts of the plant that go into the oil that you're going to make it with, you can see where we're going, right? Awesome. So a little bit of terminology here. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So if I take this, we know this is an essential oil, right? Just this thing by itself in the bottle is an essential oil. But if I take these two things, if I take these two essential oils and I put them in this bottle by itself, I fill it all up to the very top. Does anybody know what we have? S very close. Sid? Synergy. A synergy, yes. Okay, that is a synergy. Okay, if I were to take 
half of this synergy and put it in here with this carrier, then we would have a blend. Yes, absolutely. It's it's a very tricky detail, but the the carrier oil is what makes it a blend. If we if we add these two essential oils in it have a synergy, and we add one more essential oil to that synergy, what do we have? More synergy. More synergy. It's still synergy. I was tricking you. <laughs> I'm a jerk. It's okay. So. <laughs> yes, it was totally a trick. I tricked you. Okay, so our very first carrier oil we are going to talk about is sweet almond. Uh, and those of you taking notes, I will try and go a little slower because this is a, there's, this is a lot of information. So sweet almond oil. It's a little lighter on the skin than olive, so it absorbs a little easier if you're going to use this uh, on the skin. So the effect on your, it has on your magic. Even if you use sweet almond oil by itself with nothing else in it, it is good for prosperity magic. If you want to do a ritual uh, invoking the blessings of nature spirits, you could pour out a little blessing of um, sweet almond oil. Sweet almond oil is the unconditional positive regard of the carrier oils. Unconditional positive regard. It means everything you do is awesome. Everything is awesome. You know, that's like my go-to whenever I'm making anything. I didn't know why, but it makes sense. And it's a good thing to have as a, as a go-to <laughs> because of the how quickly it goes out. So you can make small batches of things and, and have just, you know, have it ready to use. What do you mean what, by what how quickly it goes out? out? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay. It's a good all-purpose, so that's, that's good. It's an easy oil to work with for beginners. Yes, sweet almond. It's very forgiving oil to work with. It's physically and psychically gentle. It's very, very beneficial for protection oils, uh, especially oils for protecting children. It makes a good base for um, love spells involving that really sweet, gentle love, like that innocent first love where you're like, hee hee, I like you. Oh, I like you too that nourishing support that two people can give to each other. The stability is three to six months. If you keep it in the refrigerator, which in this climate is probably a good idea, you can, you can keep it for nine months. With any of these oils, with any of the carrier oils, your nose will tell you if it's rancid. It will smell like old boots. It's somebody, no, I'm not even gonna take that any further. Your nose will tell you, okay? Um, and there is no trick to save it. You can't add some good oil into the bad oil and make it last. So, no, there is no trick to save it. Yes. What would you, what should you do with the rancid oil? Throw it away. <laughs> well, it actually, trash, throw it on the ground. What, uh, uh, throw it in the trash. Okay. Um, if you, if you pour it out on the ground, it will attract bad things. It would just keep, just keep the lid on it, throw it in the trash. Yes. I actually saw a recipe for using oils that go bad. Is that you use it for a candle, like an oil candle, make it big wick? No? It will smell awful in your house. It will uh, just old, sweaty, moldy, <laughs> so, just, I will, I will go into detail if you want. It will smell bad. I have almond oil that is rancid on my counter, and I'm like, you, you you want to, you you want to, you want to save it and you feel bad for yes. just throw it away. <laughs> I'll give you a dollar and a hug. Throw it away. <laughs> like I'm in a I will. Gi I give you permission. Throw it away. Yeah, or make candles for people you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Do you use it as a told them that was great. <laughs> you could as long as you got rid of it off your own property. Yeah, like if you were gonna like if you were yes, if you were getting rid of it. Like, oh I, I have no. I have a um I have a thing I have a thing about that. About getting rid of materials. I know I know here there's there's plenty of there's crossroads because we're out in the middle of nowhere. I know I know some of us uh, live in, in more populated areas and it's hard to find a crossroads where there's where there's not people because we live in populated areas. I've made it a, a mission for the last 20 years to try and move some of the, the older traditions into the realm of now where we can reach them. I was, I was talking to, to my ladies guild about this a month ago, maybe two months now. There is a modern equivalent of the crossroads where you can, where it's actually more reachable for now. Those big, nasty, 
dirty, awful, like Walmart, Super Center, malls. Those are our modern crossroads. It's a big intersection of people. It's a cross section of people. One, they're, you know, they're usually open 24 hours a day. There's such an overturn of people where it's not the same place it was yesterday because there's so many people coming and going all the time. You, one, the trash is emptied every day. So even if you threw it away today, the trash is not going to be the same where it is tomorrow. So if you come by tomorrow, you can't have walked past the, the nasty thing you threw out yesterday tomorrow. The, the shelves are constantly turned over because the number of people shopping there, the stocked, the shelves are stocked every day. So you can throw away something nasty that you need to get rid of tomorrow throw it away, turn around and don't look back. You don't want to be that pillar of salt, (laughs) but it won't be there tomorrow. When you come back, when you come back to go grocery shopping there, you know, does that matter? What? That it's not there. That it's not there. So if that means you don't come back for a couple of days, that's, that's better, but you don't want it to be there when you come back. (laughs) No, no, no. If you want to, if you are, if you are, if you are doing Dane work and you need to get rid of whatever you got, you need to get rid of. A lot of a lot of workings to talk about disposing of it at a, at a crossroads. You know, this is the modern crossroads that you can access. You know, you can't go to a a, a deserted crossroads and dig a hole in the middle. Of, you know, I don't I don't know what a, a, a busy street is now. <laughs> you can't go to the corner of I ninety five and forty and and dig a hole. But this is something we can access. You can you can go to a busy shopping center whether you know the trash is empty every day and and dispose of these things. So, apricot kernel oil. The effect on the skin is really rich. It's very nourishing. If you're using it for a massage oil, it's very, it has a a very thick effect on the skin. Uh, It's very, it has a good slip. So the effect on your magic, it's good for love magic. It has an association with Venus. So if you use it on your, on your skin, yeah, for those people who use it for massage, you're going to use a little bit and it's going to slip forever. Yeah. That's why it's going to love that. I hear you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so the effect of magic, if you can, you, if you're going to do magic for love, beauty, the arts, anything associated with Venus, um, especially for first love, the shelf stability is six to 12 months. So if you're doing an oil for any type of love magic, uh, any, any Venusian associations, use the apricot kernel oil and up to a year. Avocado oil has a, has a good nourishing effect on the skin. So your magic is for procreation. If you know someone who's trying to get pregnant, if you (coughs) know someone who's starting a business, wants to be prosperous at work, know someone who is, whose business has slowed down and they want to, uh, add a little bit more mojo to that. Okay. Not just monetary prosperity, but maybe they want to buy a house. They want to, um, they want to, they need a new car. So they need to get their credit score up. Okay. Don't just think money in their pocket. Think long term. Okay. Procreation, sex, passion, fertility. When you look at a, a nice, healthy avocado tree, they have, they have a fair number of avocados on them, right? Um, shelf stability is three months. So are you talking all of these are basically full press organic? Mm-hmm. The, the shelf stability is not affected by uh, whether or not they're organic. Evening primrose. The effect on the skin is really, really hydrating. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily for uh, massage, but you could dab a little bit under the eyes if you've got, um, especially during the dry season, keep you from uh, creating dust when you blink because it's so dry outside. Effect on your magic, it is amazing for protection oils. Uh, you can get the little gel caps in the, in the natural food section of the grocery store and just added one of those little gel caps to any protection magic you're working. It is a shielding oil. It is a sustaining oil. It's good for vision magic. If you are, or if you're working anything for, if you're working like a third eye creating visions oil, if you have a kid who is experiencing night terrors on a sustained basis, you can create a, an oil to help, you know, keep the nightmares away. You can even 
get a little pin and print, you know, picture, puncture one of the little gel caps and rub around their, around their eyes to keep the nightmares away. That kind of thing. You know, it's an, it's a physical act that empowers them to keep their, their, uh, the bad dreams away. Remember, magic is agency. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, three to six months. If you buy one of the, one of the little, um, vitamin packs of the gel caps, you can keep them in the fridge. It makes it a little easier because in the, in the Florida heat, they can melt on the shelf. Can I ask you a question? Sure. With the shelf life of all these, this is after you buy it and then it's a home? Yes. Not from the time that they right, manufacture when you... it and transport it and have it sitting on the shelf in the store? Right. They'll have the expiration date on the bottle, of course, but uh, once you put, when you make the oil, once you have it, put on put an expiration date on the label. Grapeseed oil. Grapeseed, the effect on the skin, it is very heavy. Um, some people describe it as slimy. So if you're going to make it into a massage oil for um, a magical practice, your best bet is to take another oil, uh, perhaps a jojoba, and just put a little bit of grapeseed oil into the jojoba. Otherwise, people have described it as slimy. Uh, it is very, very heavy oil. The effect on your magic grapeseed is fabulous for anointing oils because you're using very small amount, you know, just a, a, a drop on the third eye, things like that. Magic for self, especially self-awareness, self-empowerment, uh, that kind of thing. Because of the association with Greek deities, uh, grapeseed oil has u- been used for anointing uh, uh, statuary. If you have a, a, a very involved practice with deity, you can, you know, people anoint their uh, deity statues in a devotional manner. It's very neutral for magic. So if you want the, the essential oil that you're using to be able to do all the talking, use a grapeseed oil. It's good for love potions because it's very neutral. Let your materials do the, the talking for you. If you want to broadcast your magic to the universe, use a grapeseed oil because grapes are very plentiful. Okay? Grapeseed has a very, very low price, so it is very accessible for everyone. And when you're buying grapeseed because it's so cheap, just buy a little bit because it's only shelf-stable for three or four months. Jojoba! Okay. I absolutely love jojoba. It is shelf-stable from now until the end of time. Okay. I lied. Uh, I didn't lie. I will tell you the the party line is one to two years. I have magical blends that are 15 years old that are still completely fabulous and gorgeous and beautiful and that have lived in my car. I live in Delaware, not in Florida. So yes, it still gets hot, but so I hit my weather app. I've hit my weather app and it has, we have hit 127 degrees on maybe one day out of five, five years, not five days, one day out of five years, but Delaware is not Florida. But the reason that jojoba is so fantastic as a shelf life, jojoba is not a nut oil. Jojoba is a vegetable wax, okay? It is a wax and not an oil. It just so happens that it is liquid at room temperature, okay? So this wax that is liquid at room temperature is really penetrating for the skin. So if I got a drop on my skin right now, you know, probably 10 seconds, it would be absorbed right into my skin, okay? It absorbs really quickly, which makes it a great base for perfumes and magical oils because it absorbs into the skin really quickly, and leaves behind the essential oils or the whatever it is that you're putting in to your your materials. So the effect on your magic, it is great for anointing oils. It is it is the top of my list for anointing oil. Perseverance because it sticks around because it's that that heavy wax. Perseverance, absolutely. Overcoming obstacles. If you if you cannot give up, you want to stick to whatever it is that you're doing. It is absolutely important. You cannot give up. You are sticking to this. Get a hoba. Okay. If there is the least little bit of doubt and you are absolutely sure that you can't, you cannot give up for love or money, come hell or high water, use a hoba. A hoba is also really good for banishing depression magic. So again, shelf stability, one to two years. And as with every other oil, your nose will tell you when this is, when this needs to, when it needs to be pitched. Olive oil. Effect on the skin. It's a little heavier than some of our other friends. And that can lead to it getting a bad rap, but it's really great. Uh, it's very nourishing. 
One of the first things a lot of people say when I say, oh, make a magical oil or anoint your candles or do this or do that, people say, I don't have anointing oil. <laughs> you, most people do and they don't know it. Olive oil is what the Catholic Church uses to anoint their candles. Um, olive is a fabulously a magical oil, okay? It's a, it's a fabulous all-purpose blessing oil. You don't have to do anything to it. It's already blessed, okay? So it's good for anointing oils. Uh, that'll be used quickly, okay? When olive oil oxidizes, it gets that really funky smell. So if you ever, if you ever have um, olive oil that you use in your kitchen, if it spills down the side, it gets that olivey smell. I don't know why. So if you use, if you use it and you're going to use it quickly, um, absolutely grab olive oil right away. It's fabulous for prosperity because we know olives are prosperous, especially on the, you know, when they grow in the trees. If you're using, uh, if you're making a, an oil for good health, absolutely grab olive oil. If you're doing a prosperity spell for tangible property, if you're going to buy a house, if you're going to buy a car, if you're buy, if you need something real, something tangible, something you can hold in your hand, turn a key, if you want something real, okay, grab olive. One of the, one of the old um, Italian folk traditions was that if you wanted a wealthy spouse before you went out looking for a date, you would anoint yourself with olive oil. And the shelf, shelf stability for that is 9 to 12 months. Sunflower oil. Effect on the skin. It's nice and it's much more light. It'll, it'll hold on the skin for a minute or two. Effect on your magic. The energy of the sun. Okay, uh, if anyone's ever grown sunflowers, you know they, they like to follow the sun. They're very photoreactive. For the best results, reach for that sunflower oil. Protected growth. Reach for sunflower oil. If you need extra oomph in your magic, grab for that sunflower oil. Because again, you get that energy from the sun. Oh, big time prosperity mojo. And it's good on the shelf for a year. Mineral oil. I do not want you to use this on your skin. Please don't, I'll give you a dollar and a hug. It's uh, in hoodoo, it's used for commanding oils. So if you, if you need someone to do what you need them to do right now, um, use mineral oil. If you have uh, any mineral, if you have some sulfur, if you have some lodestone, if you have actual minerals, like put some mineral, put them in mineral oil. They're used in compelling and commanding blends. The mineral oil itself adds its own extra, I need you to do this thing right now, okay? The stability. According to my parents' medicine cabinet, it just never goes bad. <laughs> but keep in mind that because it is a petrochemical, because it is a byproduct of making gasoline, it will gel just like gasoline does. So if it gels, there's no remedy for it. Just throw it out and pay the whole nickel and get some more. Okay? It does. It just lasts forever. Coconut oil. There's going to be two kinds you can find on the shelf. There's going to be the solid, the, the, the fabulous virgin solid at room temperature, unless you live in Florida. Coconut oil. Okay. It's fabulous. It's gorgeous. You can do everything with it, we know. And then there's going to be something called fractionated coconut oil. And that's the stuff that's liquid. And you can, you can mix it with our, you know, essential oil friends. And it, and it looks kind of like this, except it's, it's more, uh, neutrally colored. It's liquid at room temperature, no matter where you live, unless it's probably Alaska in the winter. So the expressed is the stuff that's normally solid at room temperature, okay? Um, and you can use that for more solid applications, like rubbing into your elbows and whatnot. Um, and the liquid stuff is is going to be you can use it as a, you know more anointing oils and the like, okay? They they both work this exactly the same for magical uh, applications. Um, it's all going to be in how you're going to use it as the end result. On the skin, they're both highly nourishing. They're both beautifully done. It's all a matter of, again, how you're going to use it as the, as the end result, as the end user. The effect on your magic. It is purely magic. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I absolutely love it. For love magic. Again, if you see coconut trees in the wild, they're very abundant. So they're good for prosperity magic. And if you ever see coconut trees growing out in nature in the wild, I don't, you know, coconut trees. Coconut oil is good for goal-oriented 
uh, magic. They're very focused because, again, they're a palm-type tree, so they just go straight up. So magic uh, involving goals. And the stability for, for coconut oil, whether it's fractionated or it's expressed, is two years. So jojoba and coconut oil are both great for your shelf stability. Yay! So if you're doing anything anything larger than something like a two milliliter bottle that you're going to use right then and there, consider using a preservative. There's two different kinds that are that are commonly used. One is those fabulous little vitamin E gel caps you find in the grocery store, and they are for one ounce. You could just use one little gel cap. Again, just stick it with a pin and just smoosh it in there. Since we're only doing a couple milliliters of uh, jojoba in in a very small quantity, we'll use this up and we won't need it. The other one is something you can make at home with a little help from your local area witchy shop. Okay. When you wander in, you can ask them for some benzoin, B-E-N-Z-O-I-N, and your local liquor store. If you are not comfortable with that, if you're not able to purchase some, uh, actually taught this class in Canada and they're not, they're not even allowed to have anything over 80 proof, 100 proof vodka. Uh, you can actually make tincture benzoin with a, I use a coffee grinder for my incenses. So I actually grind my benzoin. I, I usually make a goodly portion. So I'll grind it up and I'll get two teaspoons of ground benzoin as fine as I can grind it in a two ounce dark glass dropper bottle. And I'll put my two teaspoons of ground benzoin in there and I'll fill it up with 100 proof vodka. And then I'll just let it sit for about six weeks. And a dropper full is good for one ounce of carrier to keep it preserved for an extra year or so. So what my fabulous assistant here is doing is trying uh, to make them even. I'm trying to make them even because because. What we're doing is we're making a two milliliter bottle recipe of meditation oil. One of the great things we can do is there's a company called gotoilsupplies.com. They're in the MLM capital of the U.S. out in Utah. So they, they have dirt cheap prices and their shipping is really quick. So you can get these two milliliter bottles which are, again, like, these big. And you can make these really fabulous recipes that are very quickly used up, and you don't have to worry about preservatives, um, natural or otherwise. So with a 2 milliliter recipe, including a carrier oil, once you've made your synergy, which, anybody remember what that word was? Two oils two together. Two or more yeah. oil. Two or, oil. Yes. Together. Once we do that, we take our essential oils, and we put it in there. So for a two milliliter bottle recipe, we make our synergy in a glass bottle and we would add one drop of our synergy and then we would fill it the rest of the way up with our carrier. And that would make, see I did the math for you because not everyone's a fan of math. That would make the, the percentage 2.5%, which is skin safe. Um, we always want to be skin safe. We don't want anyone with, um, to come home with chemical burns because one of the most pervasive myths of magical aromatherapy or any kind of aromatherapy is that essential oils are natural. Therefore they cannot hurt me. And this is a very dangerous, uh, myth of aromatherapy because just because it's something natural does not mean it cannot hurt you. Arsenic is natural in it and it definitely can hurt you. Okay. Uh, essential oils are the most volatile part of a plant. Therefore it most definitely can hurt you. Um, I've, I've heard everything from, you know, the, these blistering rashes are just the toxins coming out of your skin. No, that is a chemical burn. My love, please stop using that and investigate what is causing it. So one of the things that I like to make sure that everyone understands is that because of the way that people talk about essential oils, they want you to say, Oh, our, our company is, is the best company because we provide you with the GCMS test to prove that we are hundred percent lavender oil. 
That's very kind of them. That's very nice. However, that doesn't prove anything other than that probably is maybe lavender oil in there. What that proves is that at some point they tested something that did have lavender in it. That could mean that they tested something that had lavender in it at some point and they just put up the same GCMS test, gas chromatograph, uh, mass spectroscopy testing for the same lab batch of lavender from now until the end of time, just like the same mimeograph or same Xerox copy from now until the end of time. It could mean that they kept, that they took a really crappy batch of lavender and they, they added a good batch of lavender to the crappy batch of lavender. And now they have sort of a mediocre batch of lavender somewhere in the middle. It could mean that they, they took a, a sort of okay batch of lavender and they distilled it again to get a slightly better batch of lavender. Okay. All of these things would not show up on a GCMS test. Okay, so there's lots and lots of reasons why that's not the only thing that tells you whether or not it's a good batch of whatever essential oil it is that you're testing. There are a number of really fabulous ways that you can test yourself at home with things that you already have on hand, like pieces of paper and bit and, and cups of water that you can test at home uh, at the very back of uh, Blackthorn's Botanical Magic because magic is agency and I want you to have the agency to know that the materials that you're using for your magic are the the ones that best suit your wallet and your your ethics, okay? So at the very least, you should know that the the companies that you're using, the companies that you're working with, the companies that you're buying from, have the same things in mind for you and your family that you do. Okay. Hooray. So the, the recipe that we're going to use, we have our two milliliter bottle that we're going to use. And we got that from, uh, the, this is the, this company is SKS and they, they have a wide variety of materials. Um, you, so you can also shop from specialtybottle.com. They have some really great pricing on materials. And their shipping is very quick. Um, they're out of Nashville. They get to me in Delaware, um, not next day, but the day after next. Gotoilsupplies.com gets to me in two days as well. And these are all in the back of your book. Yes, yes. yes. There, that's Appendix D, Botanical Magic Resources. What do you get from Piping Rocks? Pipingrock.com um, has essential oils. Uh, and they have hard to find magical, um, uh, materials that you can't find in other places like Oak Moss Absolute, which is insanely amazing. It smells like leather and violets and it's made from Oak Moss, which is hex breaking and it's divine. It's, it's really, I just want to roll around in it. <laughs> There's a recipe in the book for a hex shattering oil. So if you either A, feel that you've uh, if you worry that you've been a victim of a hex or a curse, you can use it. Or um, it's formulated at 2.5%, just as we discussed, to be worn as a perfume or a cologne if you work in a in a gossipy, nasty office where you encounter nasty people as a perfume. Yes, it. Oh, yes. Good for dog funk. Thank you. She said it's good for that that wet dog funk. <laughs> I would never test on animals, but she has found this beneficial for her own pets. <laughs> so yes, pipingrock.com, that was a good question. How about Mountain Rose Herbs? Mountain Rose Herbs is amazing. Yeah. Um, their, their products are organic. They're fantastic. They're, they have really amazing materials. And since they're organic, their prices reflect that. So that might be something to consider you when you're... charged. Very fantastic. So... The recipe that we're going to use is two drops of lavender, two drops of patchouli, and one drop of clary sage. Six milliliters. Jojoba. Two years. Meditation oil. That wasn't sure anyone heard over the thunder. <laughs> if you're all ready, if you just want to line up, pick your bottle, and do your drops on your way to wherever you're going next. I have a question. Yes. Um, 
Yes. Oh, good. good. That was a good guess. There's a fabulous question. Yes. For those of you listening on the podcast, the question was, do you um, keep the reducer caps or do you want the, the rubber tip caps? The rubber tip squeezy bulb caps are not as good as the, the using the pipettes or the dropper caps because the, the rubber tip caps um, oxidize and they oxidize, they, one, they allow extra oxygen into your oils, which oxygen is the enemy of your essential oils. They allow them to oxidize, um, and they will age faster. They can, uh, cause all sorts of problems, but they also allow the, they also degrade the oil faster and they, the, they can cause all sorts of problems with the oil itself. And so I've, I've had them dissolve. In yes, the oil. they they will dissolve in the oil. Which is too, too so tender, yes, right? it's too warm. It's very very gross. It's it, it'll melt. It's, it becomes very gloppy. So yes, you can get a hundred pipettes from a place like Amazon for three or four dollars, or your your local you know uh, natural food store. I'm sure will also have them very cheap. And just remember to label it when you get to a place where you have your option for labels. Are there ever any considerations for the essential oils you're using as far as like shelf life? Absolutely. Okay. So your um, your citrus and your pine oils, your shelf life is two years. Okay. And um, because they're they're very inexpensive price, um, you should very much get rid of them once your two li- two years passes. Theoretically, you could you could put them in a diffuser and diffuse them, and it'll be fine. Uh, but after the two years passes, they can become skin sensitizers, and they can cause chemical burns. You could still diffuse them, and they'll smell the same, so you won't know. But they can become sensitizing, and you can um, you can get chemical burns. You can go out in the sun, and you can get burned. It, it's very bad. So just throw them away and get new ones. When you buy them, just write them on with a sharpie the the month and the year when you should throw them out. Flowers and herbs, you know, our clary sage, our lavender, our rosemary, those are three to three to five years. So when you said six mLs for this recipe, it's because you had five drops of ingredient and you're just kind of doing just about one drop per mL. Right. And then the, the really dark viscous oils, so vetiver, the resinous oils, the really dark, thick, viscous oils are going to be five to eight years. Patchouli would be in the herbaceous, so vetiver and the the, the resins are going to be really thick and gold, really gloppy. So the uh, so the um, the absolute, like the oak moss absolute, is like like thicker than maple syrup when it comes out. I really want to check that out. Oh, it's so gorgeous! Oh my god! Oh. Buy just buy you know buy some, but uh, if you don't like it, I'll buy it from you because I use it all the time. Um, but with oh, that, thank you for for mentioning that. With an absolute, because it's so thick and so viscous, one of the things that will help you in um, in working with it is to give it a little bit of a water bath. So put the put the bottle in a nice, gently warm. We're not going to boil it or anything, but put it in a cup of warm water to get it warm enough to work with. So just put it in a cup of gently you know, warm water from the tap for. 10 minutes or so before you try and you don't even try and open it because you'll just hurt your hand. But sit in there for about 10 minutes, then try and get the cap off. Don't even bother if it's if it comes with a little bulby thing. Just pull that out. Use a use a bamboo skewer or something. Dip it in there and try and and get it's that like in. Honey. Yeah, just like honey. Yes, it's even thicker than really good honey. It's it's serious. Um, but again, it's so thick. It's gonna you. It's hard to even do drops with it because it's just so gloppy. So the water bath will save you a lot of frustration. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful workshop that Amy Blackthorne did at Equinox in the Oaks. And again, you can catch her in Atlanta in July at Mystic South. If you missed how to register for Mystic South, rewind and go back and listen to Marla give you all that information. And we'll bring that information to you again in our next podcast. But now we're going to hear a song from Emerald Rose. It's a medley of Drowsy Maggie, Morning Invention, and Green Groves of Erin. I picked this song because it is definitely maple dancing worthy, and it can be found on their album Fire in the Head. 
To learn more about Emerald Rose and purchase their music, you can go to emeraldrose.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode as we listen to Emerald Rose's wonderful wild music taking us out. Blessed be and happy belting. 